Okay, it's time for another Tuesday q and I asked you guys on Instagram and TikTok to send in questions for this week's episode, and man, you guys sent in a ton. Now, before we jump into these questions, a quick announcement. Pre-order pricing for my new video course, Fretboard Fundamentals, is ending this coming Monday. So if you're at all interested in picking up the course, I'd highly recommend you do it now because it's never gonna be this discounted ever again. This video course is something we've been working on for the past couple of months, and it is a comprehensive look at all things guitar theory and helping you understand and unlock the fretboard. Whether you're a complete beginner or you're an advanced player that's been playing for years who has a few holes in your knowledge, this course was designed designed to help you understand the fretboard and the music theory for a guitar player. This is stuff that I use every single time I sit down to play my guitar or on a gig or on a session. So you can find out more information via the link in the description box down below, as well as my other video courses and my Helix profiles and Kipper profiles, all that stuff is linked in the description box. Now, let's jump in and take a look at the first question. This one came in on Instagram from Juanji05. Juanji asks, how is the studio building coming? When will we get an update? Okay, so this is the basement in its current state. Now we've been working behind the scenes down here over the last couple of weeks and we have a plan. I have a studio designer and builder named Jimmy Bird uh, who lives in LA. He's designed and built many, many studios, including Rick Beato's studio. And Jimmy came out from LA a couple weeks ago, spent the week here, and we went through and drew up a complete plan for down here. Now, there is going to be a full video series documenting the entire build out. That'll be coming probably later this year as we get further into the build, but I'll give you a little bit of a sneak peek now. Uh, the first step that we have to do is completely demolish this space. We have to pull the drop ceiling down. We have to pull these wood floors up. They're not really wood. And we have to knock out these two walls right here. The idea is to open this room up so we'll have one nice big tracking space down here. Hey, what is that? So then through here, this will be the control room. Now I'm not gonna completely spoil the plan yet, uh, but suffice to say, this room is going to completely change. Uh, right now it's a bike garage. This is where we're storing our stuff. Um, here's the bike that I crashed a couple months ago. But we're gonna be moving some walls in here. We're gonna be completely finishing this whole space. Um, and this is probably gonna be the most work of everything. Now I will say if everything goes according to plan and I can find the right one and I can afford it, which has yet to be determined, I think our goal is to put a console down here. I don't know what type yet. Uh, I don't know if it's something new, modern, or if it's something vintage, like an old SSL maybe. Uh, but the idea is to run this whole studio off of a console and go for more of an old school uh, workflow. Yes, there is a build series coming. We're working on some sponsorships right now. Uh, we're working on a build schedule. We're working on getting Jimmy out and kind of getting the whole plan finalized. There's a lot of logistics. There's a lot of things that have to happen down here, but we're going to get started on this very, very soon. I think you should go for a PS2 console. PS2? Yeah. I was, I was thinking like the PS4 because PS5s are kind of hard to get. Um, Right, supply chain stuff. But you, you think know, you think PS, PlayStation instead of Xbox? No way you want a 360 down here, man. Yeah. This next question came in on TikTok from Keller Rado. Keller asks, when filming for Backstage Journal, do you typically go into filming it with a concept or does your experience on that run shape the topic? I love this question. So I used to try and make these vlogs, the Backstage Journal vlogs, with a specific concept or narrative in mind before we even left for the gig. But I found it really difficult to make those videos. There's so much that happens when you're on the road for a single show or a whole tour, and if you go into it with a certain idea, a certain narrative in mind, it's really difficult for me at least to try and make everything that happened fit into this predetermined box. So over the past couple of years, I've sort of developed my own method of making these vlogs, which is just to try and capture everything I can. I take my camera up on the road with me and I shoot as much as I can, oftentimes coming back with an hour or more sometimes two hours plus worth of footage. And then in the edit, I will sift through the footage and try and find the story. That's the biggest thing with those videos is I want there to be a story. I want there to be a beginning, a middle, and an end, a conflict, and a resolution. And that's 
part of why I love making those videos so much. Those are my favorite videos to make. They're a huge part of why I started making YouTube videos in the first place. But when you go into it that way with no predetermined idea of what the story is gonna be, sometimes it doesn't work out. My last Backstage Journal vlog from last week was kind of straight ahead. There was no real conflict. We had a two show run, both shows were great. We had a really good time. And while it's great in the moment and great for the experience, it makes it a little more difficult to craft a video that is compelling and gets a lot of people to watch. But that's okay. That's not the point of that series. I don't make those videos to get hundreds of thousands of views or get tens of thousands of subscribers. I make them because I love making them and I want people to see what life is like on the road and actually gigging and making music for a living. This question came in on Instagram from Melodic Canvas Music. What do you think is the most overrated slash overdone pedal? And this ties in with another question that came in on Instagram. Would you ever buy a Klon? I think the Klon is the most overrated pedal of all time. And no, I would never buy one. Not at the prices that they're going for now. People are paying three, four, five thousand dollars or more at this point. For those pedals, I remember a few years ago when they were a thousand to twelve hundred bucks, and even then, looking at that, thinking there's no way I would ever buy one of those. I've played real ones. I've played several of them. I have friends that have lots of clons, and they're great pedals. I don't think they suck. I actually really dig the clon circuit. I love what it does. I love how it hits the front end of my amps. But to pay that much money for one of those pedals, not my thing. There are so many clones, so many great clones of clones that I think you can get a modern recreation of that circuit that does it justice. Uh, good examples would be the Mjolnir from Mythos or the Wildwood Mjolnir from Mythos. Also pedals like this. This is the Lawrence Petros Saguaro boost. And this is a clon style boost. It's not a clone. Uh, but this does a similar thing to a Klon. Also pedals like the J-Rocket Archer, uh, the JHS modded Soul Food, not necessarily the original Soul Food, but the modded version I think is really great. There's so many different ways to get that Klon sound that I don't think there's any reason to buy a real Klon, unless you really want one. And in which case, don't listen to me. Don't let me take your joy away <laughs> from wanting to buy something. It probably is a good investment at this point, I don't know. But for my money, I think the Klon is overrated. Now piggybacking off of that question, Gabe Williams on Instagram asks, what's an underrated pedal that you think deserves more recognition? Now this I covered in a video with Josh Scott here on my channel, underrated overdrives or boutique overdrives that you forgot about. And while I was at JHS, uh, Josh turned me on to this. This is the Stamps Drive-O-Matic. Now these were made in the late 90s to early 2000s. They're no longer made and they're somewhat difficult to find, although I jumped on Reverb and bought this one for $90. This is a really great, unique sounding overdrive. This does its own thing. It's an op amp style circuit, I believe. It's a dual gain stage overdrive. Uh, Bonnie Raitt is a famous user of the drive matic and I really love the way it hits the front end of the type of amps that I play. <laughs> amp-like overdrive to use a buzzword, I think the drive matic is a great option. Now, they're no longer made, and uh, I think that's a shame. And I think it might be time to resurrect this circuit. Uh, so be on the lookout for that possibly in the future. This next question came in on Instagram. What is something musicians should pay more attention to in your opinion? Well, I have two answers. One is a practical sort of in the moment playing example, and that is each other. 
You should be paying attention to each other when you're playing together. If you're a guitar player, you should be paying attention to the rhythm section because you are part of the rhythm section. You should be listening to the bass and the drums. You should be listening to what the bass player is doing in relation to the kick pattern, for example, and figuring out how you can fit in with that when you're playing along, even if you're playing lead or a solo. Paying attention to a vocalist as a guitar player is the most important thing, at least for the type of music that I play. Fitting in while not stepping on the vocals is a really important skill that took years for me to start to grasp, and it really started to click once I was paying attention to what the singer was doing. Outside of that, I think musicians need to be paying more attention to modern music, and I'm speaking to myself here when I say this. It's important, I think, to be clued into what people are listening to and what's popular now. Whether or not you like it, I think, is a different discussion, but you should be aware of what's happening in the zeitgeist, in pop culture, and pop music. It's easier than ever nowadays with Spotify and YouTube to sort of sit in our own little bubbles musically and artistically and never venture outside of the same playlists and albums and bands that we listen to over and over. And I think it's important to try and branch out and see what's out there. You may be surprised. The question also came in on Instagram from Simon Garza and he asked for recordings should I retune my guitar when I put a capo on it yes you should let me show you why okay so there's a few things to think about when you're using a capo on your guitar that can affect the tuning the first one is you're effectively changing the guitar's scale length you're shortening the scale length which is the playable distance of the string typically between the saddles on the bridge and the nut of the guitar when you throw a capo on you're shortening that distance and depending on how well your guitar is set up and how well it's maintained this can affect the intonation now on this guitar because it's very well made and i maintain it well in terms of fret dressing and intonating the bridge and everything it doesn't have much of an intonation issue when I use capos, but this can be a factor. So when you throw the capo on, you wanna retune. The other thing to consider is your action, how high the strings are off the fretboard. If you have higher action, when you put the capo on, you are clamping down on those strings, basically pulling them out of pitch, out of tune. So you want to retune there as well. Now, the type of capo that you use is really important. I'm a big fan of these G7 capos. I've been using these for years before I was ever on YouTube or anything like that. Um, I like these, especially for electric guitars, because these work off of a cam mechanism, off of a clutch. They don't have a spring. What that means is when you put the capo on the neck, you set the pressure, you set the tension. And I like to do it as light as possible while still letting the strings ring out with no buzz. This is different than your typical like Kaiser capo, which has a spring in it that has a preset tension. I often find that, especially for electric guitars, that spring tension is too high, so it's clamping down on the strings too hard, effectively pulling your guitar way out of tune. It's like when you play a chord, if you press too hard on the chord, you can pull it out of tune. If you have a capo with too much tension on the fretboard, it can essentially do the same thing. So that's gonna do it for this week's episode of Tuesday Q&A. Thank you so much for submitting your questions. Don't forget you can follow me on Instagram and now TikTok. I'm starting to put some stuff up over there if you're interested. If you wanna pre-order the Fretboard Fundamentals course and take advantage of the pre-order pricing, you can find out more about that in the description box down below, as well as my other video courses and Helix profiles and Kemper profiles, all that is linked down below. Thank you guys so much for watching. My name is Rhett Schull and remember Remember, there is no plan B.